welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is the daily show where we give you all the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us today is Christian Harloff. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Collider Movie Talk. Gonna be a fun one today, very cool panel. Let's get into it. Also joining us, Jason Inman. I'm always excited to talk about movies where there are possible mustaches on certain Tom Hanks. <laughs> <laughs> and also joining us, Perry Nemiroff. I am pretty pumped to be here, especially because I have my Jedi Master right here, who's going to make sure I'm all set for Star Wars Celebration. I can't <laughs> wait to go over prepping for the Star Wars Celebration panels they announced. It's going to be a lot of fun. Okay, before we get into the news today, wanted to let you guys know that the Comic-Con contest coming to a close here, so get on in there and make sure that you guys try to win a free trip to San Diego Comic-Con 2016. Some cool stuff, airfare for two to San Diego, two badges to San Diego Comic-Con, accommodations at a hotel located on the San Diego Comic-Con shuttle route, and $250 gift card for meals, transit, whatever your heart desires. Do it. If you haven't done it, go over to Collider.com and make it happen. And you can come to the meet and greet, meet all the crew here from Collider and Schmoes. We're going to be doing it. It's going to be a lot of fun. So go ahead and do that. All right, enough of this talk. Let's get to <laughs> movie talk. Natasha, what's up first? Disney Animation took to Facebook Live this morning to announce plans for Wreck-It Ralph 2. Not only that, but the Mouse House has put the sequel on the release schedule for March 9th, 2018, which takes the spot previously held by the Disney Animation film Gigantic, pushing that Jack and the Beanstalk inspired fairy tale back to November 21st, 2018. Director Rich Moore is returning to helm the follow-up, which will find Ralph wreaking havoc on the internet as the world as Wreck-It Ralph moves away from arcades and into the virtual space. Collider's own Steve Weintraub recently scored an exclusive interview with Moore about the project, where he revealed that the title Super Wreck-It Ralph is an option, but has yet to make it an has yet to make it official. John C. Riley and Sarah Silverman are returning to voice Ralph and Vanellope, respectively, with Wreck-It Ralph co-writer Phil Johnston joining Moore as co-director and writer while Zootopia's Clark Spencer produces. Christian, were you surprised by the announcement of a Wreck-It Ralph 2? Surprised the announcement happened today out of nowhere, but not surprised that we're getting a Wreck-It Ralph 2. Very popular movie. Surprised that it took so long to get the announcement in the first place, but because they held it so long, I don't know why they just didn't do it at Comic-Con. It's coming right around the corner. It was one more thing to talk about at, at Comic-Con. They probably will do it anyway now. Probably have some more things to talk about during that Disney panel. Maybe show some of the stills, kind of go over the story some more. So, yeah, the fact that it came out today, a little surprising, but not a shocker that they would make a sequel to this movie. I like the synopsis. I like the idea that they're going to go now into the internet to do this. It opens up a few more possibilities. Could be a lot of fun. Add some more stuff that's happening in the online gaming world. So there could be some cool things that happen. I think this is really smart. I'm happy that they, they announced because I loved Wreck-It Ralph. I wish it was coming out next year, but I understand how animation works, so we're getting it in a year and a half or whatever it is. Jason, how'd you feel about the news? I'm very excited about this. I agree with you. It is a little weird that they did this now, but I wonder if they announced it now because Comic-Con is going to be the reveals of the characters. Yeah, like, maybe. Because Wreck-It Ralph always has these surprises. Like, we got Sonic. Like, maybe they'll finally get Mario in this one. But I think going into the online world, like, I think it would be so neat and smart for them to like throw in characters from like League of Legends, get some Halo in there, Warcraft. maybe even Overwatch, Warcraft. Uh, I mean, go crazy. But I also would love to see some of the old school people. I would love it if Laura Croft could show up somewhere mm. in this game. Like, like the more Easter eggs you can throw into this game, the better they are. And maybe they need that month or couple of weeks to finalize the negotiations for the, all the character reveals at Comic-Con. I think in his interview with um, the director, Steve name dropped Tron too. And while he Ugh. couldn't confirm that there would be Tron in mm. the movie, it sounded like it was something that he had actually considered. But I'm not surprised that we're getting Ra Wreck-It Ralph 2. And I'm not really surprised we're getting it now either, just because, you know, beat the Comic-Con rush. And like you said, it opens the door to show character descriptions or whatever, stills, uh, more concept art, anything they can come up with at the actual event. Also, I think they might be riding the Zootopia wave just a little. The further mm -hmm. we get away from that, the less you can be like from the guy who made Zootopia. So right. that's always a good thing. But I love this idea. One of my favorite things about movies like, I know it's Pixar, but Inside Out and like Zootopia, is how good they are at world building and Wreck-It Ralph is a great example yep. of all those arcade games and they made that whole environment make sense so the fact that we're now moving into the internet I mean look at that possibility there it could be like a Zootopia type town for that kind of concept and I think they're gonna nail it all right what's next 
In an answer to the Oscars So White backlash, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences has unveiled a list of actors, writers, and directors that have been invited to join the voting membership for 2016, with diversity at the forefront of the move. 683 invites have gone out, over twice as many as last year, which saw 322 invitations extended. Of the new members invited to join the Oscar voting body, 46% are female and 41% are people of color, bringing the Academy's total to 27% female and 11% on white. The acting branch inv invitees include John Boyega, Greta Gerwig, Tom Hiddleston, Idris Elba, Oscar Isaac, Andrew Garfield, Kate Beckinsale, Chadwick Boseman, Rose Byrne, Emma Watson, and last year's winners Brie Larson, Alicia Vikander, and Mark Rylance. New directors added to the mix include Beast of No Nation director Kerry Fukunaga, Thor Ragnarok's Taika Waititi, Punisher Warzone director Lexi Alexander, Creed's Ryan Coogler, Wonder Woman's Patty Jenkins, and The Big Short's Adam McKay, and The Conjuring's James Wan. A full list of new Academy members can be found at the Oscars official website. Jason, what do you think of all the new additions to the Academy? Uh, I'm going to be the downer on this and say too little too late. I think you said that you brought up the number of the 41%. Like 41%, that number should be 85 um, the The Academy said the, now is like 11% non-white. That, that number should be 50 um, and I think that it seems like the list that you just read off, all great additions, really great, but it just seems like, oh, let's invite the popular kids that are really popular in movies right now, and let's have them over, and maybe the audience will forget that we're still a bunch of old white dudes. That, I mean, like, I, I, I don't know. I think we need to make bigger steps and bigger overtures um, to really make a difference in the Academy. Yeah, I'm gonna disagree with you. I think this is a, a positive step for what, for what the amount of backlash they are absolutely now whether or not they would have done this because they didn't have the backlash mm -hmm. that's another conversation but the fact that they heard it they it, is it a political move absolutely it's a political move but it's also moving the right direction and the reason that you're hearing about the popular choices that's how you market it mm -hmm. there are also other people that i happen to know personally that are of color and, and different ethnicity that it uh, that have been accepted that are in the the, the their producers or, or their yeah, they left writers. their names like the names the are just mm -hmm. off the list but not being promoted um because they don't bring enough bring the attention that an interest elba does you know or uh, or john boyega does so I agree that we need more, mm -hmm. but I think this is absolutely, the number went up. That's, that's, that, that is a good thing. That's, that a totally good, good that's thing. the main thing because it's progression. That's why I'm saying this is a good thing. And the people that they added, at least from the ones that we saw, are voices that we want heard. It will keep happening because they enough people made a, a, a it was it bothered enough people it it showed that everyone said this something's not right and it needs to be fixed so to me they're making steps to fix it is it the exact number we need to hit right now no but is it a lot better than it was yesterday yes yeah I think you just said it right there that's all we can ask for in a situation mm -hmm. like this it is kind of scary though that. If every single of one, every single one of these people who were invited does accept their invitation, how little yeah. difference that makes. That horrifies me more than anything. Because after all that talk, it's like you could use the hashtag Oscar So White and all that stuff, but until you break it down to the numbers, you don't realize how big of a problem that really was. Yeah. So even though this is very clearly a response to what just happened, like good for them. Yeah. You should clearly we need to be doing this. The only downside to this that I worry about going forward is where do they go from here because this was a significantly bigger number of invitations yeah. sent out yeah. compared to previous years so is this just going to be a new trend are we going to reach a point where just everyone's invited to the academy especially if they have a popular movie that comes out and there's also some people are taking issue with the fact that a lot of the people who are invited are more well known for what they do in tv and theaters and not so much movies so yeah. there are questions to consider right now but i think the fact that they did this best decision they've made recently. Natasha, very curious to your perspective on this. You hear this, they're going to be, that they have added more uh, minorities and it's the number now has gone up. Is that still, like Jason says, is it too little too late or is it a step in the right direction? Um, I mean, I think it's, it's a little bit of both. I think 
like Jason said, it should have happened a while ago, but I think any progress is better than no progress. So I'm happy to see all of these actors that have been added to the Academy and hopefully we'll be able to see that in the nominations this year. All right. What's next? Okay. Well, last week, Lucasfilm revealed a number of details for Star Wars Celebration Europe, including a Rogue One panel featuring director Gareth Edwards, but that won't be the only Star Wars filmmaker in attendance. Yesterday, Lucasfilm announced Star Wars Episode Eight director Ryan Johnson and the directing duo behind the Han Solo anthology film Phil Lord and Chris Miller will also be in attendance at the European celebration. Pablo Hidalgo from Lucasfilm's story group will host a discussion with Lucasfilm's president Kathleen Kennedy and senior vice president of development Kiri Hart, as well as Johnson, Lord and Miller at the Future Filmmaker Discussion, a panel that will take place on Sunday, July 17th at Celebration Stage. StarWars.com further teased some surprises to end the weekend on a high note. What that high note might be has the fans wondering if we will be getting a title for Episode 8, some footage, or both. Star Wars Celebration Europe happens July 15th through the 17th. Perry, do you think we'll get some Episode 8 footage at Celebration Europe? I hope I can like contain myself. <laughs> or I'm, I'm just so freaking excited. I'm going to Star Wars Celebration. It's my first time. I've always been a big Star Wars fan, but thanks to this guy right here, my Star Wars brain is like exploding right now. I can't <laughs> stop consuming content. And every single thing they announce has me so, so hyped. And obviously, you couldn't really have a bigger announcement than this. I feel like the fact that they just put it all out there and that the StarWars.com tease that, that surprise that I'm assuming is going to be something big means footage. I lean... I lean towards footage, especially because he's been shooting since February. So it seems to make sense that we're going to get some of that there. But in order to temper my expectations and not lose my mind if that doesn't happen, I'm also thinking maybe it could be an opportunity to reveal a title. Uh, lose your mind because you're going to get footage and you're going to get a title. <laughs> uh, you're going to get both. Now, whether or not we see that footage, I don't know. But you're going to see footage. If you're in that panel, you're going to see footage. They already showed footage to, in, that, in that Vegas. Well, can I ask you a question yeah. as Star Wars expert? How far ahead of time did they reveal the Force Awakens title? I'm trying to remember exactly how long it was. I can tell you that when I the first time they did Revenge of the Sith was at Comic-Con 2004. So was, a year before. It yeah. was about a year before. And I think I'm trying to, when the Force Awakens title came out, I want to tell you that it was like six or seven months beforehand. Okay, so you, don't, been, so you don't think it would be too early to reveal it now because the movie's not coming out for like another year and a half? No, because, because like Perry said, the thing with, with that movie, remember, if it would have stuck to the date that we were supposed to get it, mm -hmm. we would be less than a year away from it because it was supposed to come out May of next year. Yeah. And they didn't really change much filming schedule. They, they just gave themselves more time in post. So that being said, they've shot a lot of footage. They, at Guardians of the Galaxy, when they showed their little teaser they came up with, they were shooting for two, two weeks. weeks. Yep. And they put together a pretty solid trailer because they knew they were going to do that. Celebration is where Star Wars comes to show all the fans the big stuff. Last year, they delivered times 10. They delivered with Rebels. They delivered with Rogue One. They delivered with that with The Force Awakens. They delivered, they delivered, they delivered. And they're going to do it again this year. I think that that panel that you're going to see with Lord Miller, you're going to learn more about Han Solo stuff. You're going to learn more about maybe some casting in there. And I think we're also going to get a, a, a an announcement for a brand new spinoff film. Now, whether or not that's Obi-Wan Kenobi or whatever it might be, we're going to get the announcement for it, I think, at Celebration. That's the, that's the thing I would, I think, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised, too, if we see a new Rogue One trailer. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. for and, sure. And, and I bet you it would not surprise me if we see a poster for the Han Solo movie with like a sort of like a, this is what the rough title is, you know, cause Rogue One has changed their title like since then. But I also think like you were talking about Rebels. I hope we get an, this is something I really hope. I hope we get an announcement that Force Whitaker's character is gonna appear in the next season of Rebels and hopefully, fingers crossed, that maybe they can get him to voice it for like an episode. I now that's a dream, huh. dream world. You know, I don't think but, it's a crazy dream. Yeah, yeah. I don't think because last year at Celebration, they talked about Rebels, asked Kiri Hart, because Rogue One and Rebels was so close in timeline. Mm -hmm. And she said, we are very aware that our characters are that close in timeline. And because you have Dave Filoni and Pablo Hidalgo and all these guys kind of interweaving the story that I think Forrest Whitaker's, I don't think it's a dream. I think it's very possible that that could happen. Whether mm -hmm. or not they announce it at Celebration, yeah. I don't know. But we're going to see that full trailer. You're going to see the full trailer oh for Rebels God. Season 3. I hope this isn't a situation. I, I know what's going to happen. I'm going to be sitting in that room. Mm -hmm. and my hands are going to be like shaking while I'm typing, trying to write everything down. I mean, I'm just so freaking hyped for this. And going, not, not to get off topic, but going over that schedule. I mean, I was telling you earlier, I'm going over that schedule. And there's just so many things. Every... 
I started to make a list of all the panels that I wanted to get to and obviously all the main stage stuff. I forget yeah. what the stage is called, but everything was on the list. And then I go to the other ones and, you know, I thought I'd whittle it down, but every single thing, I mean, there's just something to learn in every yeah. realm of this from, from comics to books to movies to the TV shows mm -hmm. to just people being fans and dressing up and there's all the droid building stuff, which so I am much. oddly you're, you're very attracted to. You're going to lose your mind. I, uh, and I'll I'm going to lose my mind and come back well, broke. As, 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 <laughs> can, I, can I ask a devil's advocate question? As the big Star Wars people, obviously way more Star Wars than I am, what's the bare minimum that they would have to reveal for you guys to be like amazing? Or like absolute success. The I mean, you know they're going to do, like you said, Rogue One mm -hmm. trailer's coming out. I think some information in episode eight. The reason I think t uh, the title will come, because actually thinking about it, the Force Awakens trailer hit in like Thanksgiving of 2014. So I think the title probably came almost like a year. So it must have been like a year and two months or something around that time. Yeah. That's about the time. So that so we're around the same, maybe a little bit more. Um, as long as I got some Episode Eight stuff, some Rebel stuff, and some Rogue One stuff, just minimum, which I think you more than that, mm -hmm. I'd be happy. Yeah, I'm. I'm interested in. I'd. I'd like to see. Darth Vader? <laughs> yeah. That, that's what I think. I think, that's, that's that's kind of, I think Rogue One, Darth Vader's in that trailer. That's oh, what I have yeah, yeah. my hopes up for mm -hmm. at this point. All right. Before we move to buy or sell, we're going to take you to the Wendy cam. She has been going through <laughs> the comments and seeing what you guys have been saying. And she's going to read some of those out. Wendy, what are they saying in there? We're talking about the Wreck-It Ralph 2 announcement. Looks like the chat's really on board with this, saying it's long overdue, and the chat is hoping to see Mario making a cameo in the sequel. Movie Maniac says Wreck-It Ralph 2 is a great idea. Wreck-It Ralph should have been should have beaten Brave at the Oscars, but I have to admit Disney needs to not wait so long on sequels. For the Academy story, the chat's saying that the Academy is taking a step in the right direction, but they're also saying it's not enough progression. Uh, Obscure Media says, isn't the diversity initiative ring kind of hollow if they're only being invited because of the backlash and not on their own merit? And finally, for Star Wars Celebration, the chat's very excited about this. They can't wait to see what trailers and footages will drop. And at Celebration, and Perry, a lot of them are volunteering to go in your place because you simply can't handle it. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> oh, <laughs> she don't that up. Yeah. <laughs> All right, now it's time for buy or sell. Natasha's going to read some more stories in the world of movie news, and myself, Jason, and Perry will just say if we buy or sell it, what's up first? The first trailer for Bleed for This has been released online and is based on the life of five-time world boxing champion Vinny Pazienza, played by Miles Teller. The movie tracks the Pasmanian devil through his career-ending car accident and subsequent determination to make a comeback. Ben Younger, the filmmaker behind the 2000 Wall Street thriller Boiler Room and 2005's romantic comedy Prime, directs from a script he wrote himself with Martin Scorsese acting as executive producer. Bleed for This also stars Aaron Eckhart, Katie Segal, Carrie and Fines and Ted Levine and opens in theaters on November 23rd. Christian Byer saw the first trailer for Bleep for this. Huge buy. I've been waiting for this movie for a very long time since the stills came out. We were at AMC back in the day when um, these first images came out and I remember getting excited for this. I was a big fan of it, Vinny Pazienza when he fought. Um, I think what he did in his career was extraordinary and to see Miles Teller, this is a role I think the accent looked legit, and I'm, I'm curious to hear what, what you think about it. Granted, it was Rhode Island, but still, it was the East Coast accent that I catch very quick if it's BS, and it seemed like he was really been practicing it. He's a guy to me, Miles Teller, that when he's locked in, I am just there. Like whether we whiplash sometimes, then he, he's just doing the kind of Miles Teller thing, and I, and I don't, and I'm, I'm not as engaged. But this, I'm in there. I want to see what happens if a boxing movie is done well. It has that kind of magic. There's something about a great boxing movie that can suck you in. And the fact that when that movie is coming out and the release date of when it's coming out, I've got high hopes for this. And this trailer definitely um, added those hopes. I'm definitely buying it as well. I kind of wish the trailer didn't spell out the entire story, though. I wish it was a little <laughs> more of a tease for people who don't know the true story, which is absolutely incredible. And as for Miles Teller, I know what you mean, because in the opening parts of the trailer, he's almost doing like the Miles Teller thing there, mm -hmm. which is, you know, acting like a super cocky party guy. And at that point, I'm like, oh, you know, I don't know if he's going to pull this off. And then once it gets into the meat of the story and the heart of the story, yeah. he really excels. And I think he should have 
gotten even more recognition than he got for Whiplash. So I'm really excited about the fact that he's got something that could put him on that track. Jason. See, I'm going to be the dissenter. I'm going to sell this hmm. because of what you said that I honestly didn't know about the car crash. And that is a surprise that I would have rather experienced in the movie because that is almost like a million dollar baby turn for me. I would have never seen that coming because I honestly, I don't know the real life story of this boxer. But also I feel that we're in this weird like Miles Teller wants to party in movies phase because we just had that Jonah Hill movie too that mm -hmm. where he was like the weird War weapon. Dogs. The War Dogs, mm -hmm. yes. Um, so I don't know, I haven't seen a Miles Teller's performance that I enjoy since Whiplash and I'm now worried that he's coasting. I hope this movie turns it around, but because of that and the plot reveal, I sell. And he shot this a while ago though. Yeah, out of curiosity, that... if you had seen a trailer and it didn't go that far but it said based on a true story, would you have Googled the true story and spoiled it? No, I, 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 usually, I usually don't unless like I know the true story ahead of time. Then I would Google it. But no, no, I try to leave uh, uh, the surprise. You see, it's funny though, because this, this one's hard though. Like, how do you, I just don't know how, I understand the points and I understand sometimes we've all been on the same page A trailer sometimes mm -hmm. sell, uh, give you too much. But the problem with this is if you don't get that car crash, you don't see what he goes through, you kind of lose what the story is. I mean, because what do you, you just, if, if you put in that, how do you put mm -hmm. that trailer together? If it's just like, guy's going for the title, then something happens, but we're not gonna yeah. tell you what. It's, yeah, yeah. it's I, tough. I, I, I get it, I get it. But I also I like, feel like I can tell you act one, act two, act three now because of this. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's the problem that Southpaw ran into, but Southpaw was a fictional story, so I think it had a harder mm -hmm. road because with, as long as you are invested in Miles Teller's performance, and you and because I'm, I'm looking at some of the comments here, and some people are not fans of him, and this, he gives off this kind of vibe. Mm -hmm. But then there's other people who appreciate what he has done. He can, and I, th I think that's the thing. He rubs people the wrong way sometimes because I just I'm worried about him as an older actor because I'm worried I could see him going the Bruce Willis route mm. to where it's just to where it's just like he's like ah I'm good I'm, I I did what I had to do <laughs> but I could I don't know I don't know yet he's got so, he's so young in his career yeah. that I've seen things that he's done that I think he's got a lot of greatness in him I really do I want to give a shout out to Aaron Eckhart in this trailer yeah, too yeah. because I I can't remember the last really great Aaron Eckhart performance I've seen especially because <laughs> the first thing that's coming to mind is I Frankenstein which is just... I was going to be like Dark Knight. Yeah, that's like... A, well, probably maybe that, <laughs> yeah. which is a bit of a nightmare. But here, he's almost unrecognizable. Yeah. If yeah. his name wasn't in the trailer, I might not have known that was him. I buy, Yeah, I just I buy what he's doing so far with the character. I was, I was curious if I was going to buy him as a boxer, but I do. Okay, what's next? Warner Brothers has released the first trailer for director Clint Eastwood's true story drama, Sully. The film stars Tom Hanks as Chelsea Sully Sullenberger, the miracle on the Hudson pilot who landed a disabled plane into the frigid waters of the Hudson, saving the lives of 155 people on board. The movie then tells the story of what happened next as the investigation into the event threatened to destroy Sully's career. Written by Todd Kormanicki, the film also stars Aaron Eckhart and Laura Linney and opens in theaters on September 9th. Perry Byers saw the first trailer for Clint Eastwood's Sully. I'm gonna sound like a broken record here. This trailer reveals the whole story. I feel like I know exactly what's gonna happen. And then, I mean, it's also based on a true story and everyone knows this true story, so you could look it up. But at the same time, it doesn't really show anything beyond what we already know from the news. And it doesn't show anything that makes it feel different from Flight. And I know Flight's not based on a true story like this was, but yet, like from the way it was shot, the plot points that they choose to highlight in this trailer, I don't know. I'm going to I'm going to buy it just because I'm so well aware of the fact that this was an incredible thing that happened and I like Tom Hanks, but I was a little disappointed by the trailer. Uh other side, huge buy for me. I loved this trailer. I thought it was great. Um I think this is another thing when it comes to true <laughs> stories that when you're looking at the, yeah, we know a lot of the story. I think that flight probably took some stuff from. And I thought flight was a true story. Was it? Was was it? No, it was not. It was not. No, it was not. Okay. But I mean, because flight came out what 2011? Mm -hmm. No, when it came out, something like that. I wouldn't be surprised if they took some of the real things that kind of happened with Sully and put that towards <laughs> that particular movie with Zemeckis. Um, but it's also different because the Denzel character was a very flawed character. Um, not that Sully's not going to be flawed. He certainly went through some things and it looks very similar in what they had to go through with both characters. But the thing that makes me nervous about this movie was not the trailer. And I think that Tom Hanks looks great. I want to see the collaboration between Eastwood and Hanks. And that's two things that make me nervous. Eastwood has had some okay movies over the last some would yep. say maybe not even great movies jersey boys definitely comes to mind on that one but the other thing that makes me nervous is 
early September. We're not talking about late September when things start kicking into Oscar gear. We're talking about early September. That makes me a bit nervous, but it's not a deal breaker. Well, they could be riding the festival wave because we have uh, Tiff and Telluride right around then. So yes. if they premiere at a festival and then jump into That's release, maybe that could give it the push it needs. Although now that I'm saying that, I'm thinking about the walk, which I think but had walk, a very walk, similar... Walk wasn't, no, I think our walk was October, but still, walk Was it? wasn't terrible. The, the walk's release and it's New York Film Festival premiere, I know we're, we're kind of back yeah. to back. So you're saying you're worried that the studio is just like putting this in September, forget about it. The problem is if you go through the way that release dates normally mm -hmm. happen, like the January and most of January is usually what we call here the toilet bowl of the movie series, the yeah. season. And then if you get the begin the end of August and like the first week or two of September is usually, again, the second Another, part of the toilet yeah. bowl. But you just can't imagine that Warner Brothers would put a Clint Eastwood movie or Tom Hanks in that spot saying, oh, this is oh, just be terrible. They probably are saying, no, let's capitalize on this. Yeah. Maybe they don't necessarily think it's I, Oscar, but. I yeah, I mean, I think I'm, I this is a total buy it for me because uh, Clint Eastwood and Tom Hanks, I want to see that. And then also uh, there's two big reasons. Uh, it's on the picture back there. Uh, look at those mustaches. <laughs> oh, great mustache. Duh. And also we got a double dose of Eckhart right here. Um, but. Uh, this this trailer is just a, again a true story, but I didn't know about the scandal after Sully landed the plane. Like from my perspective, because I'm I'm not an East Coaster, I thought he just landed the plane and everybody was like applause, and then he walked into the sunset. I didn't realize that there was this entire investigation, all those things. I do worry. My worry about this is Clint Eastwood. Yeah, because you are right. Like I thought J, J. Edgar was just snooze fest. Yeah. Um, and in the past, uh, Clint Eastwood has made great films, and I'm hoping that Tom Hanks enlivens him, like excites him, and maybe makes a better movie come out of this. Uh, Tom Hanks, I think, is gonna kill it. He usually kills it in everything. Like, I was not pleased with Bridge of Spies, but I was like, man, Tom Hanks and Mark Ryland, the acting in that movie was so, so great that I could ignore the pacing issues, the plot issues. But this is a total buy for me, um, because again, that these are two great creators teaming up for the first time, and I'm hopeful that they are going to give us something great. Yeah, I mean, Eastwood is coming off of American Sniper. Yes. Um, which, you know, a lot of Oscar. I didn't necessarily really like that movie. But, I didn't either. Uh, but, I, but as far as... <laughs> I like the baby. As far as uh, <laughs> box baby. office goes, and yeah. as far as Oscar noms goes, he's, he's on the up right now. He's, he's riding this, a high. Now, regardless yeah. of what we all thought about it, it's still, the, the movie was the most profitable movie of that year. Which a lot of people don't realize it was the most yeah because Eastwood is is famous for low budgets. He always bring he he brings his movies. Uh, he makes them for very minimal money. Yeah, and then he brings them in under budget. And he shoots everything in one shot. In one yeah, he in always uses take. like the first take. One take. Uh, okay, what's next? The Red Band trailer for Why Him has been released starring Brian Cranston as the patriarch of the Fleming family who is horrified when he meets his daughter Stephanie's boyfriend Laird Mayhew, an internet billionaire played by James Franco. Within moments of arriving at Laird's extravagant estate, an obvious culture clash arises pitting the no-filter lifestyle of Mayhew against the straight edge Mr. Fleming. Hoping to propose to Stephanie on Christmas Day, Laird has to win over his potential father-in-law so he can receive his blessing. The movie is directed by I Love You Man's John Hamburg and stars Megan Mullally, Keegan Michael Key, and Zoe Deutsch. Why Him opens on December 25th. Jason, buy or sell the new trailer for Why Him? Uh, I'm gonna buy it only for the reason that for me this is a weird parallel universe sequel to Malcolm in the Middle. Uh, <laughs> if, I, if I can play that in my mind, I can go with it. But I'm a fan of anything that Brian Cranston does. Um, I love Trumbo. And it's exciting for me to see Brian Cranston go back to his Seinfeld roots, go back to his Malcolm in the Middle roots, and kind of bring some of that dramatic acting uh, uh, you know, talent back into some of his comedies. This could be the funniest movie of the year, if they pull it off. This also could be a giant disaster. The Christmas Day kind of worries me a little bit, and also it being sort of a Christmas movie worries me, but Brian Cranston is a strong enough actor. I did like I Love You Man, so I'm hopeful that this can pull it out, and I'm gonna say bye. I'm gonna buy it also, and I'll tell you what, um, that's the December is what makes me buy it. Really? Be yes, because it's another spot for studios, like December is a prime spot for when families are going out to catch 
comedies, and they put them. I mean, even though the last, I guess the Seth Rogen one didn't. Is do this not a Red Band trailer? This is a Red Band. It is a Red Band. Trailer. Yeah. Families. <laughs> well, well, I mean, it's true, families. But I mean, but people do go out to see comedy. Certain, like when whether it's not. Yeah, families could go out and see too. My brother, my brother and I, when we're all together. You know, I'm, not, I'm not talking okay, about. Okay. I'm not talking about like no just kids. Like everyone is together. Yeah, this isn't a movie that like my four and a half year olds gonna go see. But I, but I can tell you that. Uh, what this, a Christmas. When I saw this, I saw, why did she just say this? Don't worry about that. Um, but this this trailer, it definitely reminded me of Meet the Parents. Um, mm -hmm. And I can see where anyone would sell this trailer because it, 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 it is primed to be an absolute disaster. Oh, yeah. Um, but I have hopes that Brian Cranston kind of returning to comedy in this fashion could be interesting. It could be funny. And I like the director. I like that Love You Man a lot. Yeah. So this is why I have hope but when perry sells it right now i'm gonna <laughs> i'm not gonna i'm not gonna argue like, yep. she's kind of I, yeah, I can hear her breathing here. she's ready she's to go breathing um, so heavily now, <laughs> now perry you want to see this why i am just shocked right now i really <laughs> thought this was going to be a sell across the board and that's hard for me to say when it's a movie that stars brian cranston i'm also a big fan of zoe deutsch i really mm. wanted her to be a thing after uh, vampire academy and that movie obviously didn't do very well so it did not happen and she's great and everybody wants some but i want this movie to be okay for them but these jokes aren't funny. I mean, looking at this image, th this image makes me sad. That joke was awful. That's Aww. Walter White the, worried about his yeah. wife oh, behind God. him. Come the on. The only thing in this trailer that <laughs> did make me chuckle a little is when he throws the rock at the uh, the drone. Mm -hmm. I, lady. I laughed a little bit. You just, like people Just a little hurt. bit. A apparently, I like that <laughs> kind of comedy. <laughs> <laughs> just throw rocks at people and I'll laugh. Uh, Natasha, did you get a chance, uh, chance no, to see this No, I one? did not get a chance okay. to see it. So. All right, Wendy, back to the Wendy camp. So what are they saying in the chat room right now for buy or sell. Well, they're talking about the bleed for this trailer, and I'm seeing a lot of divide in chat for this. Some are selling because of Miles Teller. Yeah. Dan Allen says, I think this trailer looked great. Miles Teller seems to embody Vinny Bent Pazienza, say that slowly, from what I remember him being like, I watched him fight when I was a kid, great fighter. And for the Sully trailer, they're also buying this. Alan Mireas says, Sully is a hero. It was the media that demonized him for making a split decision, big buy. And finally, for the Red Band trailer for why him, uh, leaning towards a buy, I, that's what I'm seeing in the chat, mostly because of Brian Cranston. Lily Musai says, Brian Cranston in a comedy, I'll buy that for sure. However, I feel like this plot has been used over and over again, so I hope they do something original with this film. All right, thank you, Wendy. Now it's time for opening this week, brought to you by our friends over at AMC. Let's get into what's opening this week, Natasha. All right, The Legend of Tarzan. It's been nearly a decade since Tarzan, played by Alexander Skarsgård, also known as John Clayton III, left Africa to live in Victorian England with his wife Jane, played by Margot Robbie. Danger lurks on the horizon as Leon Rom, a treacherous envoy for King Leopold, devises a scheme that lures the couple to the Congo. Rom plans to capture Tarzan and deliver him to an old enemy in exchange for diamonds. When Jane becomes a pawn in his devious plot, Tarzan must return to the jungle to save the woman he loves. And next, our kind of traitor, a money launderer played by Stellan Skarsgård for Russian gangsters, asks a couple vacationing in Marrakesh, Morocco, to deliver incriminating evidence to an MI6 agent played by Damian Lewis. It's Skarsgård versus Skarsgård this week, and I'm going to go with the older Skarsgård because I just saw Tarzan. Not good. Uh, it's <laughs> it's it's not terrible, but it's just kind. I like David Yates, obviously from a Harry Potter fame, and. I didn't know that this was going to be a sequel, actually, from the Tarzan lore. This is very different to me than a Batman or a Spider-Man that's been told so many times that we don't need an origin story. I thought we did need another origin story to set Tarzan back into motion because not everybody is as familiar mm -hmm. with... Yes, you know he was raised by apes. That's obviously everyone I think knows many that. people don't know that he returns to London. No, yeah. and, and I think, so when he starts out that way, and then he goes back into the side mission with a new Tarzan, we don't really know. Skarsgård, by the way, as Tarzan, is great. I thought he was fine. I thought Sam uh, Samuel Jackson was misplaced. I felt like he was playing an American from 2016 and not from the late 1800s. Uh, it, Margot Robbie is always good, but it's, there's I don't know. There's just something about it. I just and the CGI to me lost me. I didn't. I didn't buy. Mm. I think I'm spoiled by Jungle Book? Apes mm. and Jungle yeah. Book. That you've got to catch up to those movies. You have the budget. You got to catch up. So I was I was let down by this movie. Do I think it's terrible? No, but I just 
I think it's enjoyable to watch maybe on TV and then just forget about it. As far as the other one goes, um, I don't know anything about it, but it just sounds a little bit more rich to me. But Perry, Tarzan. Uh, I didn't see it, and did. I didn't. No, you didn't. And based on your reaction, I don't know if I want to see it at the same time. <laughs> it's Alexander Skarsgård, so whether it's a big fat mess or really boring or whatnot, I don't mind staring at him for two hours, so I, I guess that's okay. Yeah. The only movie I saw opening this weekend is Purge, which crushed my, crushed my Purge-loving heart, oh. so mm. maybe I'll go see Tarzan just because of that. Jason? Um, I have not seen Tarzan either, um, but I'm going to go with the uh, the... John Le Carre uh, book because uh, our kind of trader. If if you know John Le Carre, you know his books. They're really good uh, spy books. They're great. They're like James Bond yet very more realistic. And Ewan McGregor is an automatic win for me because I think he makes a lot of interesting choices with his career. Uh, I don't think it's going to do well in the box. I actually think Finding Dory is going to knock both of them on their butts. Yeah, I'm I'm more interested in the one you're talking about also. Obviously, because I've seen Tarzan. I just wanted to see more of Tarzan actually in the jungle with the apes, all that, and less of him. Uh, you know now domesticated i think that that's that's where they lost me and and the ending you talk about a trailer you watch the tarzan trailer the whole movie the whole movie the, the whole movie uh, they give you the ending so if you care about tar tarzan movie and you want to see it do not watch the trailer again because they give you everything christoph waltz by the way is just becoming a one note villain and everything that, that he's doing sucks. it's oh it's like tarantino is the guy that saves him he's the, so uh, let make sure you keep doing movies with him because the last couple movies he's done he just no, hasn't been anything too spectacular. Uh, sorry to be such a bummer. Time to move on. Um, <laughs> before we do that, Perry, you got a chance to sit down with some peeps. Who'd you sit down with? I did. I, if you watch Collider Nightmares, you know that me and Mark Riley, we got to sit down and talk to the director and the actress in Carnage Park. That's Mickey Keating and Ashley Bell. We're really hyped about the movie, and we have the opportunity to do a special screening of it next week, Wednesday, July 6th. And... I'm going to be there, Mark Riley's going to be there, John Schnepp's going to be there, and we have the opportunity to let a few of you come with us. So if you want to come see Carnage Park with us in L.A., so do not enter if you do not live in the L.A. area, please tweet at Collider Video and make sure to include the hashtags Carnage Park and include the hashtag Collider Nightmares. Just say, you know, whatever you want. I want to come, and we'll count that as a submission. We are going to randomly select some winners, so make sure you do that by the end of the day on Monday day because on Tuesday we're going to pick our winners so hopefully you'll be coming to see Carnage Park with us all right guys make sure you go ahead and do that and we're going to get to mailbag right now and before we do that also remember that we're going to be taking live tweets at the end of the show so head on over to at collider video Natasha will be going through those ask anything you want ask movie news go behind the scenes whatever it is Natasha's going to go through them and we'll take a couple before the end of the show but now it's time for mailbag you guys have been submitting at collider video at gmail.com we picked a few out and we're gonna go with them so what do we got david m writes greetings collider folk a long time viewer and this makes my second question mailed to you guys lots of people refer to the act of turning their brains off when they watch movies i have a serious issue with this practice there's a huge distinction between a movie being popcorn but being good enough in other areas to be excused pacific rim in my opinion and a movie being dumb and only viewable as good as if you don't think about it too much or at all transformers my question is, should we really be accepting being told that they only work when you dumb yourself down? What makes the movie turn your brain off dumb and what makes it good popcorn fun? Thanks and keep up the good work. Uh, we've talked about this a few times. I think it's it's subjective. It really it really is because what I wanted Independence Day 2 to be was what Independence Day 1 would, was. And it was silly, defined logic. Who cares? Shove popcorn in your face and have a fun time with it. But I still think going with your question was that you still have to give me characters to care about. You still mm -hmm. have to give me a story to follow. And I think a movie like Transformers 4, I don't care about. I don't care about anything happening in there. I'm not invested in anything. So it's not just blowing things up and destruction in order for me to go, hey, this is still a good movie. Uh, that's that's just for me that I don't do that. Other people can do that and say, that's all I wanted to see. I was just going for the, like, like something for me for like the, the Fast and Furious movies are fun popcorn movies for me. I care. They're fun action movies. The mm -hmm. fifth one turned because I didn't like the other ones and then once the fifth kind of shifted into this action movie, I know now when I go in there, I'm gonna everything's going to defy logic, and I'm going to see these ridiculous fights, and I'm going to see things that human beings can't really do. 
but I'm going to have fun doing it because I care enough about the people, the characters involved, and the way that the filmmakers have done it for me. So that's that's my definition of it. How do you see it? Well, I've had to kind of train myself not to say that because it's such a common phrase that even though I don't really mean it, I have in the past said, oh, like, dumb, turn your brain right. off kind of movie. But that's, I think people, when they say that, or I can't speak for everyone, obviously, but when I have said it in the past, I mean more of a sit back, relax, and enjoy the show type of right. movie. I don't think any movie movie you could justify oh turn your brain off and that makes it good because that obviously makes no sense whatsoever but a movie can be super silly for example I like Hansel and Gretel witch hunters more than most people because I think even though that movie is absolutely crazy and ridiculous what they do in the movie works within the context of the movie mm -hmm. works within the tone they set so right. I think there are a lot of movies that work that way for example like Pacific Rim Independence Day Resurgence, not so much, but I don't want to get into that or I'm going to be talking the rest of this episode. I always took the popcorn, uh, just put popcorn in your face, is, yeah, a movie like where you basically know what the act turns are going to be. Like, you know, the good guy is going to meet the girl, they're going to have a plan, the villain's going to beat them, but at the end of the day, you know the hero is going to win and there aren't going to be a lot of plot surprises. But the characters, like you said, are what surprise you. The characters are like enjoyable and they're engaging, so you're willing to go through it because like, oh, the actor gives a good performance. Like, I know he's going to win, that's not the turn. Um, yeah, I agree with you. Like, if you got to turn your brain off to watch a movie, just don't watch the movie. Like, this, it's an unwatchable movie. Um, but it is, it is very, very subjective. And it's interesting that when you think about popcorn movies, because to me, the distinction between a popcorn movie and another movie is like, would this movie, for me, get critic awards? Would this movie get Oscar awards? Like, is it a film? compared to a movie. Right. Um, and, and by that definition, if you want to even go a subjective, then like there are certain superhero and Star Wars movies that can jump down to the popcorn level. Because like at the end of the day, do we know that Luke Skywalker is going to win? Yeah, we, we do. We do. But but like the characters and there are some surprising plot turns. And then it just goes into this whole subjective mess and we're just going to keep it in this repeating cycle. But um, it is very subjective. If a movie is too dumb to turn your brain off, if you have to turn your brain off, don't don't watch that damn movie, like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2. And, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, the, I agree with you. I, I was disappointed when you talked about Independence Day Resurgence. I have not seen it, but I've heard the same thing like you because Independence Day 1 is a eat popcorn. Yeah, it doesn't make any logical sense, but it's fun. You're gonna have fun with it. Because yeah. like Brent Spiner and Bill Pullman. I must have sighed into the microphone like Many 10 times. times and and Brent episode. Spiner is one of the worst things in a movie and he was so much fun in the first mm -hmm. one. But he's, uh, it's like, it, and it's not his fault. It's Emmerich just telling him to go, go do, do more, do yep. so much more. It's like, no, easy, easy. <laughs> uh, anyway, all right, what's next? Lucas Ocampos writes, who do you think got the best out of Brando in his performances for well-known movies? Elia Kazan on Waterfront and Streetcar or Francis Ford Coppola, The Godfather and Apocalypse Now? I would have to say Coppola on The Godfather. It's just, but the question is, did anybody really get the performance out of him, or did Brando just decide <laughs> something in his head to, that day was gonna <laughs> was gonna work? Um, he was just an a, a second time using this extraordinary actor. He he just there was something about him. That's why he's considered one of the greats of all time. But Coppola just had a very special relationship with him. Coppola got exactly what he wanted to, and as uh, there are other ones that did. Um, but I, I don't know. There's just something magical I thought about what Coppola got out of him. Uh, I think it's Kazan. I think On the Waterfront and Streetcar have some of the most amazing performances on film. And, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is it On the Waterfront or is it Streetcar that he actually played that role on stage? I thought it was Streetcar. It's Streetcar. I, I, think, I, I thought. Yeah, yeah. It's Man, one, one of them. And and he transcends in that. Like there's that that close up of one of the speeches, and you could see like the veins in his head, and like he feels it. I for me, I feel older Brando. Uh, especially when I heard what he did in Apocalypse Now, where like he just was like, "I'm not gonna read any of your lines in the script. I'm just gonna say whatever I want, and it doesn't matter." Um, but like in Streetcar, he's doing what an actor's job is to take the text and transform it into something real and something living. And I feel in those movies, he did it. So I like young Brando, not old Brando. Yeah, I had both On the Waterfront and Apocalypse Now on my list. Because On the Waterfront, I mean, that's such a great nuanced performance where he feels like a real person that could exist and that you could know. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's kind of the driving force of that movie. And obviously the issue with Apocalypse Now is, you know, the stories behind it. I mean, I think of the horror speech and you, you don't even have to see Apocalypse Now. You can go online, <laughs> Google that speech, just watch that speech and it sucks you in. Yeah. No, whether you know what the movie's about or not, Mm -hmm. that will make you want to see the entire thing. But then again, is 
that the director pulling the performance right. out of him or is that just what he felt like doing <laughs> at that day and time? Okay, before we get to the Twitter questions, I want to let you guys know, big match happening here tomorrow between Mark Baby Carrots Ellis going up against <laughs> Little Evil JTE. It's their second match. Like I told you guys the other day, you want JTE was accused of cheating in their first match, and we put him on trial. You can find the trial at JTE, and you'll see what happened. A lot of history with these two. It's going to be a lot of fun. That happens tomorrow. Um, but another thing that I, don't, I think I announced on Twitter, I didn't really announce it uh, on air yet, I'm going to be competing on August 5th once again next to the gentleman sitting to my left. And I call him a gentleman. It's going to be a good match. It's going to be a good, a good a straight up gentleman fight. It is, fight. man. A good yeah. match to Cheers. you. Uh, I'm, looking forward, I'm looking forward to playing Huzzah. this guy. He knows his stuff. It's going to happen August 5th. Check it out. We put in a, a kind of a ranking of the top 10 contenders. If you want to see who the top 10 contenders are, Mark and I did a video yesterday. He's pretty highly ranked right now. So go check that out. It's over on the Schmoes channel. Mm -hmm. All right. Time for Twitter questions. Let's get into it. Okay, Ace Kennedy asks, good afternoon, guys. Do you think we will ever get an incredible sequel? Thanks, and have a great rest of your day. Yeah, they're working on it. They announced it. They yeah, announced he's, it. Uh, I, as far as I know, he finished the first draft, and he's working on the second right now. Yeah, so Brad Bird doing that mm -hmm. again, is that's that's what he needs to be doing to recover from Tomorrowland. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, that's the that's the one sequel that I've been the most, uh, and I have the most anticipation for is Incredibles 2. Like, so I'm so glad that it's finally, I think when they made that announcement last year, I believe, I think everybody was like, cheered. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Everyone loves that. That movie. Mm -hmm. Everyone has such a soft spot for that movie. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised they didn't make that sequel sooner. Yeah. But then again, all you need with an animated movie is one teeny tiny thing to derail it. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, you add an extra however many years because those movies take so long to make. Yeah. All right. What's okay. Nice? Christopher Woodburn asks, what film were you guys very excited for but ended up being very extremely disappointed by? <laughs> Go ahead, Perry. I love how that came back to me. Yeah. Independence Day Resurgence. <laughs> I, I am really bummed we didn't do a full-blown review of that because I could go down that IMDb and say something negative about every single character. Yeah. The reason and the main reason I desp I don't even just dislike it. I despise Independence Day Resurgence is because there is now no way to separate it from Independence Day. That yeah. movie can ruin the original because of how deeply connected the events of Resurgence and those characters and what they're going through mm. are to what happened in the original. And he just does such terrible things to certain characters from the original movie. I mean, I don't want to spoil anything here, but broke broke me. I was really upset. I'll, I'll give you Rocky Five, and I'll give you, uh, <laughs> and I'm gonna give you Spider Man Three. Those are the two that I was like really, as a kid, super excited for Rocky Five, and couldn't wait to see what was gonna happen. It's the one we don't talk about. It's the Voldemort of the uh, <laughs> series. As, you must not be. Named. Yeah. Um, so, and as Spider Man Three, because you're coming off of that great Raimi Spider Man Two film. And then you run into singing and crying and dancing on pianos, and it's just an and a, emo hair. It is and such just a sad. train wreck, and, I, and I'm not blaming Raimi for that. I'm blaming the, the studio for what they made him do with so many different characters, and it just became a, a mess. So we don't like to talk about that one. Mine is easily um, Star Trek in the Darkness. I'm a wow. huge. Star Trek fan, huge Star Trek fan, and, and 2009 Star Trek knocked it out of the park. I was like, yes, Trekkies are accepted in society, and then we get into that movie, and about 45 minutes into it, Benedict Cumberbatch reveals the secret that everybody knew, knows, they're, it's Keith Khan, and they're just doing a bad copy of Wrath of Khan, which is the best Star Trek movie ever made. And I, as a theater goer, I remember hearing that, and I can remember hearing people gasp in that theater, and I'm like, what, you idiots? Like, are you serious? How did you not see this coming like a million miles away? And I feel that, you know, Star Trek 2009, we had, we had, we had, we had golden Star Trek back. And, and Star Trek Into Darkness gave it a black eye. Punched it right in the face. Thanks a lot, J.J. It's amazing how Star Trek fans <laughs> hate that movie. Like, I, I like that movie. Um, I, it, it, I'm one of those idiots because like, I, <laughs> I, I am. I, I like that movie. I, I, like, you talk to a diehard like, Star Trek fan, Man, they it's like it's like they gave him Rocky Five. It's really it is. It, it is the Rocky Five of Star Trek movies. Yeah, Star Trek fans <laughs> hate that movie. I didn't mind it. I thought I it was, was fine fun. with it up until that point. But mm -hmm. I think that's just because I'm on the computer and on the internet mm -hmm. all day. So that was just like really. Well, you really? shouldn't be that's on your computer the in the theater though. Yeah, that's right. impolite yeah. to read. Let's not do that during the movies. <laughs> all right, let, 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 let's let's do two more. All right, my boy Bazinga guy asks. You love with, Bazinga guy. <laughs> I do. I try and space it out, but okay. No, you he don't. asks good questions. You love he Bazinga asks good <laughs> questions. I think it's you writing yourself in the middle of the. Uh, <laughs> it show. is me. That was a great Twitter name. Yeah. <laughs> okay, he asks with tons of original films coming to Netflix, could we ever get a Netflix film nominated at the Oscars? 
They've pushed for it. Yes. Um, Beasts of No Nation, yeah, I think, came, should have been nominated. Came that, close, it yeah. seemed like. Uh, it was such a strong movie. I think I think we just have to push past the, we have to get the Academy. The Academy's always slow uh, to, uh, I mean, it took three Lord of the Rings movies to get Lord of the Rings up there. I think it might take three or four Netflix movies of like Beasts of No Nation's caliber to make the Academy be like, well, we better lean over here. Well, maybe with all these new young members in the Academy, they'll go. be more well aware of what Netflix is releasing. So for all you know, I mean, I don't know, again, because of what we said before, yeah. the percentages don't really change that much, even with 600 plus new people in it. But in the future, you know, if they keep doing it. Well, you hit it. It's, that's a, it's a generational thing. Mm -hmm. um, as the generations start to move into that percentage that we were talking about with the Academy voters, that's when it's going to happen more. More opportunities are going to be there for Netflix films. More movies are going to be made. Uh, the Adam Sandler ones, no, those will never be uh, nominated, but there will be movies. Not the do-over? No, but there are going to be more. <laughs> uh, the media is changing. Media is mm -hmm. changing the way that Netflix movies are released. We're going to get more of them. There's gonna, you're not going to be able to ignore them because you're going to get yeah. that movie. That Not that Beast wasn't great. But you're going to get one of those movies that just hits where it's just going to be an outcry of you have to nominate this movie. Mm -hmm. That performance was just on point. And when you have a, another big director directing one of these movies and it's the it's a marketing machine. And once the marketing machine starts to steer towards that, we will get it eventually. Now, whether or not that's next year or in six years from now, it'll happen eventually. Another real question is, will will the Academy ever change their rule that you have to show it in an actual theater? Like, well, they did, though, the Beast. You know, they showed they, Beast they Unlimited. Yeah. Like, when, will we ever get to a point with the Academy where it's like, no, it can just be streaming and that counts? Probably not. I it don't doesn't, think. I mean, probably not in the near mm -hmm. future. Yeah. I don't foresee a future where we can avoid that, though, yeah. given yeah. everything that every company out there is doing to up your experience watching something in home. We just did a Collider <laughs> news story this morning. You Natasha, can have IMAX in your home for four hundred thousand dollars, or even a million dollars. So that is oh absolutely God. ridiculous, and mm -hmm. not for all of us here. But that is just another step towards. And also, there's all those boxes, those premium boxes out there where yeah. you could pay like insane uh, subscription fees and get movies that are in theaters yep. in your home. So clearly, not for the general public. But that to me looks like baby steps in that direction. All right, last Totes. one. All right, Thomas Bergstrom asks, which non-franchise movie to be released in 2017 are you guys looking forward to most? My pick is The Snowman with Fassbender. Wait, say that one more time, Natasha. Which on. non-franchise movie to be released in 2017 Oof. are you looking forward to most? That's going to be a tough one. If you notice, we're all Googling right let's, now. Let's, that's a harder one to do right now. Let's let's get another one, because that, that one's just, with, we have to look okay. up. This Alexander movie. Burton asks, I read articles saying that the 20, or 2016's box office will be down from 2015's box office. Do you agree with this? Yes. And I was just, I, Cody and I were talking behind the scenes before, and I, Tarzan, I said, oh, another stinker in the summer. Or just another not, it, this summer has not been satisfying so no. far. You got Civil War, you got. Civil War kind of ended the summer for me. I know. It started, I mean, it started <laughs> it off, um, and there really have I mean, and Dory, but I mean, there hasn't been, like last year was boom, 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 yeah. kept hitting you. And then you had The Force Awakens, which is, even if you didn't, if you hated that movie, the movie is the highest grossing domestic movie of all time. You're not going to get that this year, even with Rogue One. Rogue One's gonna, is gonna start pretty big. And I still think Rogue One will, it, it's not gonna have the opening that The Force Awakens had. It's gonna, I think it opens closer to, in December, closer to 120 million than anything else. Um, so the movies have been far more disappointing and we haven't had the billion dollar, we had like, I think like five or six billion Million dollar movies last yeah. year. You haven't had those this year. Why did we all just have brain farts with that other question when Star Wars is coming out every year? But yeah, but, you, but, but non, non franchise. Oh, non franchise. Yeah. That yeah, yeah, was the yeah, yeah. question. Yeah. Well, that basically eliminated. Clearly, I, I mean, failed that at that, that, that question like, twice. Yeah. Well, I, I, I kind of hope that, and I don't know, I hope this is studio scene that because we've been in this five year cycle now of studios slapping any kind of franchise or branding name on a movie and just making a movie and slamming it out there. And I think this is the year where we're getting a lot of them where they were just like, get it out there, doesn't matter. Does it have a book title? Put it out there, put it out there, yeah. put it out there. Um, whereas like last year, it was like the quality, I think, was just way up there whereas this year I think and maybe last year was everybody being like Star Wars is coming we got to be ready like that might have been some and the concern they're just like ah, oh, we don't care it's yeah. also a problem with 
ticket prices too and just the fact i mean we're going back to the streaming issue of people not wanting to go out mm -hmm. and pay those insane prices when you could sit at home but last year was the same thing and he said and it, was, last year it was, was the same thing but i feel like it's easier for people to decide to sit home when you have reviews coming out for mm -hmm. movies like independence day resurgence sure. where the the review is rock bottom mm -hmm. and i mean i had actually spoken to people who said you know based on the review yeah i'll just wait until it comes out on yeah. last on year was also like a big like i remember last year like every movie that people were like we would talk or whatever and everybody would be like you got to see this one you got to see this one then this year it's just kind of like avoid it avoid it yeah. avoid it it's been like yeah that. yeah all right that is today's episode of collider movie talk before we say goodbye to everyone here i do want to talk to wendy real quick and see what you guys have been saying about anything that we're talking about on the twits or whether it be a <laughs> mailbag wendy what were they saying well, for the films that they were excited for and came back disappointed, there was a long list. So we have Phantom Menace, Batman v Superman, Superman Returns, Crystal Skull, Age of Ultron, Iron Man 3, Vacation, and The Hobbit movies. Mm, All right. Well, thank you so much, Wendy. And I'd like to thank everybody joining me here today. First, Jason Inman, where can I find you? Uh, you can find me every weekday on DCL Access, but you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at Jawin, J-A-W-I-I-N, where I do a weekly podcast called Geek History Lesson, where I teach you about all kinds of geeky stuff, including superheroes and Star Trek. Star Trek Beyond. Yep. Right next <laughs> to me is Perry Nimmeroff. Perry, where can they find you? Guys, I'm trying really hard to find an answer to that question, and I'll uh, tell you. Just do it on your Twitter. Just do it on your Twitter. It's just one He's franchise film after yeah. the next. You guys can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at P. Nemiroff, every Tuesday on Collider Nightmares and every Saturday on Best of the Week. Natasha Martinez, where can they find you and Bazinga Guy? <laughs> well, not together, sorry. But um, <laughs> um, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at NatashaLexis underscore. Before I get going, very, very excited and happy to announce that yesterday we debuted the Top 10 show with John Rocha and Matt Nost. They went over the Top 10 Spielberg movies. That show is up right now. Super happy with the response. Those guys have amazing chemistry. You should go and watch that show. If you're a movie lover, the guys have a lot of fun. It's a different take on the Top 10 list. It's something you should be checking out. They will be doing that show every Wednesday, so make sure you go on over there and check it out. For me, I'm Christian Harloff, Twitter, Instagram. Check me out today on Collider Jedi Council. We have Ralph Garner on the show that's going to be a lot of fun and the schmodown between baby carrots and little <laughs> evil goes down tomorrow so check it out thanks for joining us and we'll catch you tomorrow hey guys if you like this video click the thumbs up button also make sure you subscribe to our youtube channel it'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at collider